At 15, she thought her biggest challenge was living up to her late mother's dreams while dodging her father's strict rules. But when a 22-year-old court member arrived in her village, all shiny smiles and city swagger, things got complicated. One secret glance turned into stolen moments, and before she knew it, she was carrying the weight of a decision that would change everything. Now pregnant and abandoned, she's left to face her father's fury and a village that won't stop whispering behind her back. And as for him, the charming core member is nowhere to be found. What happens next will test her strength in ways she never imagined. Curious to see how this young girl's story unfolds. Subscribe to Vanna Storytime for more captivating tales of love, betrayal, and the unexpected twists that life throws our way. You won't want to miss what happens next. In the heart of Amachara village, where tradition hung in the air like the smell of fresh palm wine, lived 15-year-old Ijioma. The villagers would tell you that her father, Okonkwo, was as stubborn as a goat tied to a tree. Once upon a time, he had flirted with Christianity to marry Ijoma's mother, but when she passed away, so did his faith. Okonkwo cursed God, threw away the Bible, and dusted off the family idols, returning to his beloved gods like a prodigal son. Only, there were no fatted calves in sight. Ijoma, however, was her mother's legacy, the one thing her mother fought for the chance to get an education. But Okonkwo, he didn't care much for such modern nonsense. His heart beat only for his sons, who followed in his traditional footsteps, worshiping the old gods. Ijoma, the odd one out, was a burden, a reminder of what he lost, a girl who was supposed to follow her brothers, but instead followed books. And yet, out of respect for his late wife, Okonkwo allowed her to go to school, even if it made his face twist like he'd bitten into a sour fruit every time he saw her in her uniform. Then came Kunli, the 22-year-old NYSC copper who landed in Amachara like a gust of fresh air, and with it, a bit of trouble. The NYSC, National Youth Service Corps, is a program where fresh university graduates are posted to different parts of the country to serve for one year. It's a way for them to give back to society while also promoting unity among the country's diverse regions. For Amachara, Kunle's arrival was like bringing a touch of the modern world to their quiet, tradition-bound village. Tall, charming, and full of city swagger, Kunle quickly became the talk of the town especially among the young girls who hadn't seen such a fine specimen in the village. Ijoma wasn't immune to his charms either. Though she was shy, her eyes always followed him when he walked by with that confident stride, his khaki uniform crisp like it had never seen a wrinkle. Ijoma's stepmother, Nika, saw it all coming from a mile away. She was a sharp woman, always cautious and practical. Ijoma, don't get too close to him, oh, she would say, her voice tinged with warning. These city boys come with sweet words and nothing else. By the time they're gone, you'll be left holding nothing but heartache. But Ijoma wasn't listening. She was young, curious, and drawn to Konle in a way that Neka's warnings couldn't stop. Little did she know that her bond with him would soon unravel her life in ways she could never have imagined. Amachara village may have been steeped in tradition, but with Kunle in town, Ijoma was about to learn that some bonds are stronger than family, and others, well, they can break your heart. It had been two months since Ijoma first started hanging around Kunle, the copper who taught in her village school. At first, their meetings were innocent enough. She would see him during evening tutorials, her heart racing each time he smiled her way. Soon, one thing led to another, and Ijoma found herself in deep water, pregnant. It was her stepmother, Neka, 
who first noticed. The once bubbly girl had turned into someone who seemed perpetually nauseous, eyes darting every time someone mentioned marriage or babies. Nika wasn't one to jump to conclusions, but when Ijoma kept running to the backyard every morning to empty the contents of her stomach, it was time to call in the village doctor. His diagnosis? Pregnant. This can't be happening, Nika muttered under her breath, pacing around the kitchen like a chicken that had just seen the knife. We have to keep this a secret at least until we figure something out. As the village doctor and Nika were whispering, trying to hatch a plan on how to cover up this small inconvenience, they heard the heavy footsteps of Okonkwo approaching. Like a hawk, he swooped into the conversation, catching just enough to send him into a full-blown rage. What did I just hear? He bellowed, his deep voice sending chills down Nika's spine. Pregnant! Who has brought this shame upon my household? Nika's hands trembled as she clutched Ijoma's arm, knowing there was no escape. It's not what it looks like, I swear, she stammered, though even she knew it sounded unconvincing. Okonkwo's eyes narrowed, his face turning a dangerous shade of red. This is the curse of modern education, he spat. Instead of learning how to respect her family and uphold tradition, She's out there disgracing us. This is what comes from chasing books and following these corporate boys. Without another word, Okonkwo stormed into the compound, dragging Ijoma out of the house as if she were a goat meant for sacrifice. Get out of my sight. You are no daughter of mine, and I don't want to see you. His words stung harder than any slap. Ijoma, tears streaming down her face, had no choice but to leave. But Nika wasn't about to let the poor girl go completely empty-handed. Nika sneaked into Ijeoma's room with a small bundle of clothes and a handful of coins. She pressed them into Ijeoma's hands, her eyes full of guilt and fear. Take this, Nika whispered, and be careful. Your father will kill me if he finds out, but I can't let you go like this. Ijeoma nodded, her heart heavy but grateful for the little kindness. She knew Neka couldn't openly defy Okonkwo. After all, her sons were Okonkwo's pride and joy, destined to follow in his footsteps. If she rocked the boat, she risked losing everything. That day, Ijoma gathered what little she had and decided to find Kunli. Surely he would take responsibility, wouldn't he? Her heart clung to the hope that somewhere, in the same village where he lived, there would be refuge. But the neighbors, the people in the surrounding villages, they all feared Okonkwo like a bad curse. No one dared offer so much as a sip of water, let alone shelter, to Ijoma. In their eyes, to cross Okonkwo was to invite disaster into their own homes. And so, with her fate sealed by her father's wrath, and the judgment of the village, Ijoma set off to find Kunli, the one person she believed could still save her from this nightmare. Desperate, Ijoma found herself standing outside Kunle's house in the village, clutching her small bundle of clothes and an even smaller sense of hope. When Kunla opened the door, his eyes widened in shock. Ijoma, as she explained to him, he exclaimed, you're pregnant, and your parents chased you out. He ran a hand through his hair, looking like a man who'd just been told he was going to the moon, unprepared. For a moment, Ijoma held her breath, waiting for the harsh words, the disappointment, or maybe even the fainting spell. But shockingly, Kunli smiled, a broad, warm, teeth-flashing smile, and pulled her inside. It's fine. Don't worry, you can stay here, he said, acting like her knight in shining armor. Ijoma's heart fluttered with relief. Maybe, just maybe, things would work out. Maybe Kunle was different from the others. That night, she slept peacefully, cocooned in the warmth of hope. But the next morning, she woke up to the sound of 
nothing. The bed beside her was cold and Kunle was nowhere to be found. Confused, she rushed out and asked the other Corps members. They exchanged awkward glances before one finally broke the news. Kunle? Oh, he applied for a transfer months ago. It got approved last week and he left before dawn. Ijoma's heart sank. He was gone. Just like that. Abandoned. Again. And to add salt to the wound, later that same day, the landlord came knocking with an expression that could curdle milk. This house rents overdue. You can't stay here. With nowhere to go and no one to turn to, Ijoma gathered what little she had left and wandered the streets, surviving on the last of the money her stepmother had given her. But after five days, even that ran out. Exhausted and starving, she could barely keep her feet moving. After five long, harrowing days, Ijoma stumbled into Obinze, a small town with a quieter air and kinder faces, though none of them were willing to offer her a place to stay. Tired beyond words, Ijoma found herself at the river bank, contemplating if this might be the quiet place where she could let go of everything. The thought of dying there crossed her mind. Just as she prepared to sink into her sorrow, she noticed an elderly woman struggling with her water pots by the stream. Without thinking, Ijoma rushed over to help. The woman, surprised by the gesture, looked at her with a softness Ijoma hadn't seen in days. Ah, my daughter, thank you. What are you doing here alone? The woman asked, her voice warm and gentle, like a hug in sound form. I, I have nowhere to go. Ijoma admitted, her voice breaking. Nowhere. The woman who introduced herself as Mama Afeoma sighed deeply and placed a hand on Ijeoma's arm. Come with me. I live alone. My hut may be small, but it's enough. As they walked, Mama Afeoma shared her story, how her son, Chinedu, had gone abroad ten years ago and never returned. Despite the rumors of his death, Mama Afeoma still believed with unwavering hope that he would come back one day. The villagers whispered that she was cursed, thinking she was delusional for holding on to that hope. But Mama Ifeoma didn't care about the villagers' whispers. She welcomed Ijoma into her little hut, treating her like the daughter she never had. In that small, humble home, Mama Ifeoma taught Ijoma the basics of survival, how to work on the farm, how to carry on even when the world seemed to have forgotten you, and perhaps most importantly, how to hold on to hope. People will think what they want, my child, Mama Ifeoma would say with a smile. But as long as you keep going, you're still winning. For the first time in a long while, Ijoma felt like she had found a place where she could heal, even if the journey ahead was still uncertain. Eight months into her pregnancy, Ijoma waddled through each day like a tired duck that had seen better days. Her swollen feet, paired with the non-stop kicks from her unborn babies, made her feel as if she were hosting a dance party she never signed up for. But finally, one quiet evening, the twins arrived, a male and a female, two tiny bundles of joy with lungs powerful enough to let the entire village know that they had made their grand entrance into the world. Mama Ifeoma, beaming with joy despite her frail frame, took one look at the babies and smiled like she'd just won a lottery. These are the grandchildren I never had, she said softly, brushing a tear from her eye. She named them Akin and Ifeani, the names she had long dreamed of giving her own grandchildren, had her son ever returned home. Ijoma, though still dazed by everything, found comfort in Mama Ifeoma's gesture. The names felt like a piece of hope amid her whirlwind of chaos. The twins became the light in Ijoma's life, even though the sleepless nights often made her question why babies didn't come with a mute button. But for all the exhaustion and uncertainty, Mama Ifeoma was there, sharing stories, 
rocking the twins and offering Ijoma a kind word whenever she needed it most. Then, as life tends to be both kind and cruel, four months later, Mama Ifioma passed away. One minute, she was there, telling Ijoma about how she believed her son would still return. The next, she was gone, leaving behind her small, quiet hut and the twins she had named. The village of Obinze gathered, as was the custom, to help bury the old woman. They dug, they wept, and they whispered. But whispers in Obinze often held more weight than facts. Superstitions were woven into the very fabric of the place, and soon the villagers' talk shifted. They'd always thought Mama Ifeoma was cursed. What else could explain her long, sorrowful life? And now, Ijeoma, with her two children, seemed to be carrying that curse forward. She's just like Mama Ifeoma, they said, shaking their heads with the kind of certainty only superstition can bring. First, she turns up pregnant with no husband, and now she stays in the hut of a woman who lived a cursed life. It's a bad omen. We must rid the village of her before the curse spreads. Soon the villagers gathered money. They approached Ijoma with the same look they gave when shooing away a stubborn goat from their farms. Take this and go, they said, practically begging her to leave. But Ijoma, stubborn in her own quiet way, refused. I need to stay until her son returns. There's something I must give him. I promised Mama Ifioma. The villagers now convinced that Ijoma wasn't just cursed but downright possessed, had no more patience. If you won't go, then we'll send you away, one of them huffed, and send her away, they did. With the swift, brutal efficiency of people who believe they're saving their village from the wrath of unseen forces, they chased her from the village, torches in hand. In a final act of symbolic cleansing, they burned down Mama Ifeoma's hut, as if to erase every trace of the curse they believed lingered there. As the flames consumed the small, simple home that had given her so much comfort, Ijoma held her twins close, her heart heavy. She was once again on the road, with nothing but the clothes on her back and the lessons Mama Ifeoma had imparted to guide her. The villagers may have thought they were purging their land of a curse, but all they'd done was ignite a new chapter in Ijoma's journey. Ajoma found herself wandering through another village, Eziyama, with her five-month-old twins. The village was small, quiet, and seemed to move at its own lazy pace. With her children bundled close to her chest, she moved from one farm to another, offering her services in exchange for food and shelter. Her strength was running low, but her resolve stayed strong. She had managed to save a little money, though it was quickly depleting. Every step she took felt heavier than the last, but she kept going, driven by the instinct to survive for her children. When she reached the edge of Eziyama, she saw rows of yam barns, stacks of the crop that would soon be prepared for market. A woman, Mama Nkechi, stood at one of the barns, watching Ijoma approach with weary but kind eyes. Looking for work, are you? She asked, eyeing the baby strapped to Ijoma's back. Ijoma nodded, her exhaustion showing. Yes, I can help with anything you need. Mama Nkichi studied her for a moment, then gestured towards a heap of yams. You can start here, peeling these for me. Ijoma got to work without hesitation, her hands moving quickly despite her fatigue. The hours passed, and by evening, Mama and Kechi took pity on her. It's getting late, she said, her tone softening. There's no proper place for you here, but I can offer you the yam barn for the night. It's warm and dry. Relieved, Ijoma thanked her and settled into the barn as dusk fell. The air was thick with the earthy smell of yams, but it was a place to rest, and that was enough. She made a small nest out of straw for her babies and sat beside them, her body aching from the day's work. 
As the moonlight filtered through the cracks in the barn's walls, she held her twins close, thinking of everything they had endured together. Another night, she whispered to herself, stroking her children's tiny faces. We made it through another day. The days in Eziyama blurred together, each one bringing more farm work and barely enough food to get by. Ijoma worked hard, peeling yams, harvesting crops, and helping wherever she could. She earned enough to keep her children fed, though every night ended the same way, in the yam barn, surrounded by silence and the weight of survival. Even in those quiet, lonely nights, Ijoma found moments of peace. Her twins would smile at her in their sleep, and she would smile back, knowing that as long as they were together, they would keep moving forward. The barn might not have been much, but it was shelter. It was safety. And for now, it was home. It had been a long, dusty month since Mama Ifeoma's passing, and Ijoma had settled into her quiet rhythm of working on farms, living in the shadow of the old woman's memory. That was until one afternoon when a car, so shiny it looked like it had been dipped in gold, rolled into the village. Heads turned, whispers flew, and children ran after it, shouting in excitement. The driver stepped out first, opening the back door with the smoothness of someone used to serving the rich. And then out came a man, tall and broad, with a sharp suit that screamed, I've made it. This was no ordinary village visitor. He was met with eager faces and murmured greetings as he asked around about his mother. It didn't take long before someone pointed him in the direction of Ijoma. She was sitting outside, cradling her twins when she saw him approach. Even without knowing who he was, she could feel the weight of his presence. This was someone important. Are you Ijoma? He asked, his voice shaky. Ijoma nodded slowly, standing up as she balanced one of the twins on her hip. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm Chinedu, he said, his words barely making it past the lump in his throat. My mother, Mama Ifeoma, she... Before he could finish, Ijoma stepped forward, her eyes softening. I knew it. Your mother was right. She talked about you every day. She never gave up on you. She believed you'd come home. She gestured to the twins. She even named these little ones after the grandchildren she hoped you'd bring home one day. Chinedu's composure shattered like glass. He sank to the ground, tears streaming down his face as if he had been holding them back for years. I should have come sooner. I should have been there, he choked out burying his face in his hands. Ijoma knelt beside him, her hand resting gently on his shoulder. She was happy, Chinedu, truly. We made a home together, and she was proud of you. She never stopped telling stories about how you went abroad, how you'd make it big. She was right, you did. Chinedu looked up, his face wet with tears, but his expression softening. Thank you, he whispered, wiping his eyes. Thank you for being with her. They sat in silence for a moment, the sun setting low over the village. After a while, Chinedu stood, dusting himself off, as if regaining some of his composure. I can't bring her back, he said, his voice steadier now, but I can honor her memory by doing what she would have wanted. He looked at Ijoma with a determined glint in his eye. You and the twins, come with me to the city. I'll help you, whatever it takes, be it your education or anything. You don't deserve this life of struggle. And who knows, he added with a smile that broke through his sadness. We might even take a trip abroad. Mama would have loved that. Ijoma blinked, not sure if she had heard him right. The city, the city, she repeated her heart skipping a beat. Her mind raced with possibilities she hadn't allowed herself to dream of in months. And maybe, just maybe, 
the hope she'd buried deep within her was starting to rise again. She looked down at her twins, both now fast asleep in her arms, and then back up at Chinadu, the man who had returned, bringing with him not just memories of his mother, but the promise of a brighter future. And for the first time in a long time, Ajoma smiled. Let's go, she said. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a golden glow over the village, Ijoma took a deep breath. The weight of all she had endured, her father's rejection, Kunli's betrayal, the villagers' harsh whispers, seemed to lift with the promise of what lay ahead. She had survived storms that would have broken many. And now, standing on the edge of a new beginning, she realized something. She wasn't alone anymore. With her twins nestled close and Chinedu by her side, the road ahead seemed brighter than she had dared to imagine. For the first time in her life, the future didn't feel like an enemy, but a gift waiting to be unwrapped. Her mother's legacy, her father's curse, it had all led her to this moment. And though the journey had been hard, she knew one thing for sure. The story wasn't over. It was only just beginning. As they set off for the city, Ijoma glanced back one last time at the village. Then, without hesitation, she faced forward, toward hope, toward possibility, toward a life she could finally call her own. <laughs>